a warm welcome once more. Uh, and I pass the floor to Margarita. Thank you, Boris, and a good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, or good morning or good evening, depending on where in the world you are uh, connected from. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to, to chair today's webinar and, uh, and to welcome our, our speaker, Beth Singler, Dr. Beth Singler, um, Homerton Junior Research Fellow at the University of Cambridge, where she's exploring the social, philosophical, ethical, and religious implications of advances in AI and robotics from an anthropological perspective. Dr. Singler is also an associate research fellow at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence, where she's collaborating on the AI Narratives and Justice Project. Her background is as a social anthropologist of new religious movements, and her monograph is the first in-depth ethnography of the Indigo Children, entitled The Indigo Children, New Age Experimentation with Self and Science. Dr. Singler has also written on the development and legitimation of other new religious movements and digital identities through social media and online conversations. Today, she will present her paper entitled Blessed by the Algorithm, Religious Conceptions of AI and Their Impact on Society. Just Beth will have 25 minutes for her presentation and will then have 25 minutes for uh, our Q&A discussion. If you have questions or comments, just write in the chat box that you have a question. So you, you will book your spot in the Q&A and I will, will give you the floor later. Without further ado, Beth, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me today. Let me just see if I can get technology to work, which is always a miracle for me. Oh, Great. <laughs> okay, well, it wouldn't be a presentation for me if something didn't go slightly wrong with the technology. Let's hope that is the last thing. Uh, so I'm going to talk today a bit about some of my research into this concept of being blessed by the algorithm and where we find this expression and how it might tie into some wider trends in the discourse around artificial intelligence and its entanglements with religion. If there's anything that uh, I say that's particularly unfair or if I have to rush through anything particularly quickly, uh, the paper that this uh, talk is based on uh, came out in March in AI and Society. So please do take a look at that as well. It expands on some of the ideas I'm drawing in here. And there's a few new things in this talk that aren't necessarily in that paper. Um, I first came across the expression blessed by the algorithm as an ethnographer doing digital research into the discourse around artificial intelligence, primarily on social media. Now, it's not a, a hugely common expression, not in comparison to some of the expressions that get much more virality online. But it's very interesting for two particular reasons. First, these tweets involve examples not only of parody, but also metaphorical language and even ontological assertions about the way the world really works. And there's slippage between those modes of expression. Uh, so they, I see them as a starting point for considering the impact of even very casual online comments on public discourse about AI. Second, the, the blessed by the algorithm expression can be explored for a variety of conceptions of the agency or even super agency of algorithms slash AI in the public mind with connections made with other representations of super intelligent AI that we might already have seen, such as the singularity. Now, the first example that I have found comes from September 27, uh, sorry, 2014, as in this image here, and it's primarily about the success or failure of content that is presented online. And so here we see the metaphorical use of the language. Now, following the examples that I could find, I find a very popular one from 2018 from Keith Coleman, who was a VP of product at Twitter and previously CEO at Yes Inc. I'm, I'm very sorry for, for interrupting you, but um, could you maybe speak a little bit close to the microphone? Because oh, yeah, uh, I thought my headphones had a microphone that would help. So if that's not picking it up, Perhaps I need to swap back to my laptop microphone. Uh, I, I, I think it's, it's all right. Let's, let's, uh, let's keep it this way and we'll see how it goes. Thank you, Beth. Okay. I, I, can, I can raise my voice a bit too if it's not clear. Uh, so Keith Coleman says he overheard OH from an awesome Lyft driver. Today's been great. I've been blessed by the algorithm. So in this instance, it's about the success or failure of operating in the gig economy as a human being, the sense that the algorithm, this slightly mysterious, non-transparent thing has decided that this Lyft driver will have a good day. 
A few more examples here, which I've summarized briefly with these headings. Ideas about abstract success with tweets not actually saying specifically why the individual feels that they've been blessed by the algorithm on that day. Success or failure of content on platforms like YouTube or Instagram. And uh, examples of language parody around religious examples. So there's uh, various different prayers to the algorithm, uh, ideas that this might become an increasingly common idea, or um, a sort of non-religious text speak drawing on religious ideas. I looked over the examples I could find between 2014 and when I did my data collection in 2019 in October. And as you can see, there's a specific peak of interest and retweeting of this, this concept, this tweet. Uh, but overall, we're not talking about very large numbers here. And there's 181 tweets altogether. But again, I think it's an interesting small example. I coded these tweets in various different ways, looking at the thematic elements to them. So whether they dealt with the success or failure of content on platforms, as I've mentioned, uh, people feeling that they've been recommended something by the algorithm that was specific to them, uh, that's the appropriateness of recommendations, success or failure, as I say, the gig economy job, kind of abstract tweets that didn't really relate the feeling to anything in, uh, specifically, uh, those that drew on religious elements that prepared prayers or creeds or ideas around an AI god, negative tweets, people saying that they felt they hadn't been blessed by the algorithm and had actually a bad day or a bad recommendation, and science fiction references of various kinds. So it gives some idea there of the frequency of those different categories. And then also there were tweets that fell into more than one category, so both one and two or one and five. Um, in the instance of the success or failure in a gig economy job, these primarily were retweets of uh, Coleman's lift tweets with additions. That's worth noting as well. I also looked for cursed by the algorithm examples and found very, very few. There were only seven in the same period. Uh, and these were primarily of similar sorts of categories, but far, far fewer of them. What I was really interested in examining these examples is to what extent people were drawing or reaching for culturally familiar concepts and language to express the understanding of something that's apparently inexplicable, the algorithm, as it appears that their understanding through YouTube or Spotify or Lyft or Uber and the gig economy, and questioning whether this is a sense of AI being seen as a replacement for God, an omnipresent uh, figure. Uh, noting that the AI fits into the God space argument might be in danger of supporting a rather strict, narrow version of the secularization thesis, or perhaps providing as an idea of pathological interpretation of religion as just fulfilling a need for people and not seeing its other aspects and qualities. Whereas I'd like to argue that perhaps this is more an example of the continuities of enchantment that are entangled with our conceptions of technology and in AI in particular. Other examples of where AI has been placed in this God space, and we see other such continuities of enchantment, would be specific AI and new religious movements, some of which I've written about in this article and elsewhere, so the Order of the Cosmic Engineers, the Turing Church that evolved from it and has links with it, the Way of the Future from Anthony Lewandowski, who also worked previously at Google, the Church of Perpetual Life, which is more of a transhumanist church, thinking about uh, life uh, in uh, longevity and how to enhance that, and the Mormon Transhumanist Association and the Christian Transhumanist Association, both of which see themselves as natural uh, products of the foundational ideas of both Mormonism and Christianity. So looking specifically at the, tell, uh, the Turing Church and examining their closest material to doctrine, the tales of the Turing Church, I, I drew out in this article and, and in my research more fully, where religion is being implemented as a tool, again, returning to this idea of how we reach for culturally familiar terms and ideas. I think Julio Prisco, the case of the Turing Church, perhaps takes this a little bit further in suggesting a pragmatic use of religion. So religion as a tool, he argues in this, in this book and elsewhere that we need new positive solar action oriented spiritual movements based on science to keep us enthusiastic, motivating and energetic as we take the first step towards the cosmic frontier. It's a very practical application in his mind of the charisma and authority of religion broadly constructed uh, and its use for the transhumanist movement as he sees it. There. He does also argue that there's a possibility of producing theism from deism. He says, I'm persuaded that we will go to the stars and find gods, build gods, that being AI, become gods and resurrect the dead from the past. 
with, uh, it's covering up my lines there slightly, so I can't see it, advanced space-time engineering and time magic. This idea drawing on uh, the idea of any sufficiently advanced technology appearing like magic. There's this blurring of the lines for his conception of what technology might be able to do. This idea that ultimately there could be a real theism, but it will come about through these technological processes. There are other spaces in which this reaching for familiar cultural conceptions of religion occur uh, can also appear in very apparently secular spaces, even more so than the Turing Church with its pragmatic use of religion. Uh, I've looked also at uh, Yuval Noah Harari's use of dataism as a, as a replacement for religion, he, or he, in his view of history, he outlines how progressive rationality will ultimately do away with the existing religions but he sees this burgeoning interest in data and technology as a forthcoming religious concern. And again, some of the language around this uh, draws on the same kind of practical interpretation of what religion is, but also has the potential for charismatic authority. So for example, in Homo Deus, this techno-religion that he's talking about, um, that there is this candidate, this techno-dataism that he's interested in. And his conception of religion, again, has these very practical ideas that it is a tool for preserving social order, for organizing large-scale cooperation. It's a deal versus spirituality, this dichotomy he introduces between the religious side and the spiritual side of life. And religion seeks to cement the world, the order, whereas spirituality seeks to escape it. Again, this binary interpretation. And this, again, has an impact on public discourse around technology and artificial intelligence. So data is in itself, if he identified it as a forthcoming religion or focus for humanity, it could actually become a religion that people ascribe to. So again, a, just a very brief example here of a tweet where someone says they're not sure if they're a techno-humanist or a dataist, using Yuval Harari's term, and whether this kind of expression becomes more viral and more uh, seen on social media is yet, yet to be proven. But I think it ties in thematically with some of the, the concepts I'm trying to draw out of the blessed by the algorithm discourse, that there is this way of talking metaphorically that can blur with ontological realities. So for Harari, I don't think he at any point is expected to sort of push dataism as an is or an ism that could be adopted, but we see people doing anyway. And further to this, some of my previous work I've mentioned has been on the legitimation of new religious movements. And I just want to outline some of the frameworks I've been using in that and how I would apply that to the discussion around artificial intelligence as well. So drawing on Lewis's work, which itself draws on Weber, you can talk about the tripartite scheme of legit legitimation for new religious movements, rationality, tradition, charisma. And I'd argue as well that both tradition and rationality can be viewed as having their own charismatic authority. For invented religions, a lot of the time, the focus has been on their creativeness. So new religious movements arriving in the last 100 years or so that draw on primarily sort of fictional, science fictional based narratives. And that origin story, that creativeness is very obvious. And some scholars have suggested there isn't a way of arguing for the legitimation of new religious movements through tradition because they are so new. However, I've argued conversely that social media is one among a number of spaces for conversations about new religious movements that then lends them this feeling of tradition and history and credibility through a snowballing effect. And this can occur in other spaces, of course, including um, sorry, census, the census, which I wrote about for the 2001 and 2011 censuses in the UK, the media, and there's an example there from uh, Good Morning Britain in the UK with the lovely Piers Morgan uh, talking about Jediism and the conversation again growing and snowballing as figures like that do so. And even the anti cult movement itself in discussing new religious movements can lend them legitimation. So, returning to AI, when it comes to agential AI, this snowballing of legitimacy, I think, occurs due to the same three factors you see in new religious movements. And this is sort of a, a kind of meta discussion beyond the AI and new religious movements, how AI itself partakes of some of the same forms of new, as new religious movements. So, for example, returning to the tripartite scheme, charisma, who is talking about AI and what is their influence in capital and network reach? Well, we have figures like Elon Musk and previously Stephen Hawking, very well-known public figures who, for some sectors, have a lot of respect when it comes to talking about technology and science. AI itself, I'd argue, also inspires enthusiasm and interest. Uh, we have 
uh, lots of conversations and hype around AI itself. When it comes to tradition, we also have a long and wide cultural history and I, I, that we could be unpacked and say actually a lot of these examples are very Western civilization based, but broader work is being done on AI narratives around the world. But mythology around the golden handmaids of Hephaestus, the golem, science fiction stories like RUR and more recent science fiction give us a sense that this is uh, a concept, the super agential AI is a concept that's been around for a while. And rationality for some, the presumed near future success of AI is rational based on some dominant enlightenment era assumptions about intelligence as a capacity and how mind is set at the body substrate. So it seems natural as a telos for AI that it's going in a particular direction and therefore super agential AI is going to happen. The danger, however, is that some of these elements are being informed, as I say, by the hype around AI and also a robot, the uh, formations of robotic AI that aren't legitimate, but give the appearance of technology is far more advanced than it is. So we can talk a little bit about how we trust agential AI, how we assume it's agential, and how that leads on to super agential AI that we see in these religious conceptions. So you may have come across uh, Wolfgang Bukepson's uh, auto automaton chess player from the 1700s, quite famous fake robot with the human being in the cabinet playing chess. And some uh, scholars of history and science have suggested that this is a product of its time, an empirical performance, as Stafford says, to help people into thinking of technology in a particular mode. And Sussman argues that it illustrates the belief-inducing theatrical conventions of this genre and this particular time, and it was necessary to convince the public that technology was going in a particular direction. And moving on to the modern Mechanical Turk, Amazon's Mechanical Turk, which itself is also a robot, but within this system of parceling out gig economy jobs, there are people taking on tasks for artificial intelligence. Uh, so here we have an article from Wired in 2017. Manish Bahatia talks about how he began working on Amazon Mechanical Turk as a side gig, something he's doing beyond his primary employment, and that he was involved in training machine learning algorithms to do things like make purchasing recommendations based on past behavior or characterize content by genre. And he enjoyed thinking of himself as the AI behind the AI. The problem for him particularly was that he wasn't being paid, but the problem for us is that it presents AI as far more advanced than it actually is, because if there are humans in the machine, much as there was with the original Mechanical Turk. And this example, Sophia the Handsome Robot, showing an illustration here of how the presentation of robots that not actually as advanced as they seem to be can lead the discourse uh, here on popular entertainment program Fallon Tonight in a particular direction that leads us to presume that robots are better than they actually are. Now, in a discussion in, uh, I think it's 2018, 2019, at COGEX, a big technology festival between uh, David Hansen of Hansen Robotics behind Sophia and some other robot ethicists like Joanna Bryson, the discussion moved to seeing uh, David Hansen argued that the fear was more like a character art or, and a research and development platform and shouldn't be taken literally. And yeah, he made references to Bernini's sculptures and Norman Rockwell's paintings and asked that we wouldn't necessarily question the ethics of their presentation. They were fictional, but he could see the fear as a new art medium made out of robotics. And he includes other examples like uh, non-player character game, characters from video games where the fictional status should be obvious. But I argue that there's this seamless blurring between fiction and fact. David Hansen's previous employment at Disney sort of feeding into this, that actually a lot of people online and offline take Sophia as, as, as an example of presentation of the superiority of current, current robotics and trust her and trust the presentation that's being given far more than they should do. And returning to the algorithm again and the blessed by the algorithm and tweets, this is the same sort of over trust that the presentation of what is possible with AI and the, the place in which the algorithm takes in people's lives is leading them on to more and more trust, uh, that actually that's distracting from what's actually happening. And then we see those religious interpretations as well. So for example, this tweet from 2019, someone saying that every time I use curated content, music playlists, pop articles, news briefs, recommended movies, I'd worried I'm being brainwashed. Will I trust AI more than humans? Well, we are seeing increasingly the discussion around AI elements of both fear and trust. And I have some examples here of 
people saying or claiming that they would trust AI more than humans. And again, with this shift between parody and ontological assertions online, it's not always clear where people land and how those boundaries are maintained or not maintained. So for example, we've got uh, people here saying they would trust AI more than humans in politics in particular. And I try to be fair there by having a tweet both about Democrats and another tweet about Republicans, two sides. But uh, this idea that perhaps the rationality or the super rationality of AI might be more useful than the irrationality of human politicians. People speaking there also in generally how that they would treat, uh, expect AI to be more trustworthy than humans because humans are unpredictable. And a specific example there from in the medical industry, uh, I welcome a medical industry based on robotics and AI. And these are just a small group of example of where the, the, the narratives and the presentation of AI and robots, including Sophia, including the mysteriousness of the algorithm that's non-transparent, that makes decisions for Lyft drivers, for Uber drivers, for people on uh, YouTube platforms who want their content to be promoted. All of this combined leads to this sort of mystifying of artificial intelligence and to this final conception, perhaps, of an AI god, both in the new religious movement specifically that I've talked about, but also in a more broader, diffuse sense of people imagining that AI has this level of agency or even super agency. And we're getting to this, this stage far beyond the technology is capable of anything that we're presuming it can do. It cannot make these sorts of decisions for us, but we are enabling it to do so because we are leveling our trust into it. Uh, so the kinds of questions I've been thinking about in my research that I've tried to sort of broach here, and we might just discuss a bit further, is whether we're perceiving AI as having agency for it really does, and how the idea of AI agency is entangled with our religious tendencies and our tendency to look for something to place in the God space. And the question of whether we'll be handing over our autonomy to AI because of these presentations and their assumptions, the narratives and stories that we tell about artificial intelligence long before it's agential or even super agential or even godlike. Thank you. I hope that has all been clear. Like I say, if there's anything that wasn't completely clear, uh, I have written up a paper specifically on the subject that's available at AI and Society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Beth, for your presentation. And now I can open up the, the Q&A session. So um, if you have any questions or comments, just feel free to, to write uh, in the chat box that you have a comment or a question, and I will give you the, the floor. All right, we have one from Boris. Boris? The floor is yours. Yes, uh, Beth, thank you very much for this uh, fascinating, very, very um, rich talk. Um, uh, at the end, you, you were alluding to the possibility that we will give um, or delegate decision decisions to, to AI um, or agency to AI long before it's actually uh, Potential. I mean, in a sense, we're already doing this. Um, for if you think, for instance, of um, AI-driven um, um, loan decisions in banks or in uh, the financial, uh, in the stock market uh, sector, and so on and so on. In a sense, there is um, there is already um, a lot of um, um, delegating going on, and uh, so I was wondering whether. Um, whether you've taken these concrete examples of existing things into account as well. Absolutely. A uh, project I was involved in, I think about two years ago now, uh, with the Royal Society here in the UK, and uh, it was funded by Google DeepMind, but mostly run by the Royal Society, was on drawing in citizen juries to discuss the extent to which we should be automating our decision-making systems and the kinds of cases they were specifically discussing with the citizen juries of about 20 or so people were things like uh, loan decisions, medical decisions, uh, and a lot of the conversation there was sort of setting up the public awareness of how much these decisions are already being made 
and then discussing to what extent transparency should be regulated. So it's more of a policy conversation ultimately. Yeah, absolutely. We, we see already the extent to which uh, these decisions are being automated. I think what I'm trying to push towards here is that we have this, but we're also assuming it's happening where it's not happening. So these are the examples where it's happening. In the UK, we have a perfectly terrible example this summer from the A-level results where an algorithm was created by the government to do exactly what they wanted it to do. And then the government, when it all went terribly, horribly wrong because the results were very poor, um, the government then blamed the algorithm. It lended agency to something it had created with that goal in mind and started talking about it being a mutant algorithm. So what I'm pushing towards here is that, yes, we have absolutely decision-making systems involving artificial intelligence and machine learning already, but we are also assuming that they have agency in places that they don't. Uh, and I think the, the level of public education around that needs to be so much better. And I think that's one of the things, one of my concerns where it's useful to, to highlight this to discourse as a way into a broader conversation about how much AI is influencing our lives or being presumed to influence our lives when it's not. Thank you, Beth. Okay. There is one more question. Um, Professor Durachi. Hi there. Hi, Beth. Thanks for a very nice lecture. Um, I have a question about the narrative structure here because many of these visions of robotics and AI that you're engaging, they're driven by narratives that are um, composed specifically for the promotion of those technologies, right? And that happens in pop science, it happens in science fiction. Um, but those narratives, they're, they're also deliberately kind of visionary and exciting to their audiences. So given that there might be some dangers in thinking about the technologies that way, what kind of narratives do you think would be compelling to an audience but maybe less likely to lead us or, or more likely to lead us toward a more coherent view of the agency you're talking about, um, you know, and, and a more collaborative and, and sensible vision of how we use our technologies. Yeah, it's, it's difficult because I think the primary response to overhype and utopianism in AI narratives is to kind of go flip it the other way and to be the purely dystopic. And that's certainly true in the media and the press. I, you know, the latest story about what Elon Musk is up to is often counterbalanced with Terminator imagery and we're all going to die. And I also don't think that's a particularly useful narrative either because it still ensures this idea of AI having its own direction, like the techno determinism saying where we're headed with this technology is the only way that we can go. And I do think there needs to be a wider discussion on the choices that societies make about where their technology is going and not this assumption that this is the only direction that we can go in. It is difficult because the more reasonable discussion that neither falls into the traps of utopian or utopianism or dystopianism isn't as charismatic as those two binary ends of the spectrum. The middle ground of actually there are difficulties involved and we're, this is where we're at and this is what technology can actually do is, is a little less uh, enthralling for audiences. So uh, I've had this conversation with journalists before about the overuse of Terminator imagery and they'll say, well, we have to use Terminator pictures because robots are so static and boring. And that anyone who's actually interested in technology, I think, would push back against that. They actually know the robots that literally exist now are really interesting. What are they doing? But there's, there's still this uh, the kind of clickbait culture in the press and media that goes to these binary ends of either it's going to be brilliant or it's going to be terrible. So I don't necessarily have a solution for that because it's about how the attention economy works in our contemporary society in the press. And when it comes to these kinds of stories, it's very difficult to be as clear as possible and be uh, gaining views. I know this as someone who's made short documentaries on AI and robots. The same day our, I think it was our second film came out, our second film on friendship and AI. And we didn't even go into the companionship and sex robots. We mostly focused on friendship. The same day that came out, Slaughterbots came out with uh, Stuart Russell and I can't remember whether it was Seth, was it Berkeley? I don't remember, Stanford maybe. And Slaughterbots got 3 million views because it's about drones who are going to blow up your head. 
So it's it's a difficult battle. I think my film was a little bit more uh, balanced on that, uh, on the narratives. But yeah, it's very difficult to get something that engages and goes viral when it comes to narratives that don't really draw on those two extremes. Sorry, um, I don't have a solution. Yeah, yeah, no, that's all right. Uh, I appreciate the thoughts there. Um, also, if I'm not mistaken, and I could be mistaken about this, I think that some of your research project groups have also interfaced with policy people a little bit. Is that correct? I'm just kind of wondering about if you could speak a little bit about your work in that domain. And if I'm totally wrong, then what you would like to see kind of happening in a policy conversation to think, yeah. work these issues out. So on the policy side, yeah. So the AI narrative project I was involved in with the Center for the Future Intelligence, we did a project with the Royal Society specifically on conceptions of AI and how they can be difficult and harmful. There's a report came out, I think it's like two years old now. We also spoke to the select committee from the House of Lords here in the UK. So cutting through the techno, I'm specifically gonna talk about the UK context. I don't have much engagement beyond that, but in the UK context, there is a strong line of techno determinism and a desire for AI, super companies, basically. It, they aren't here yet, but a lot of the discussion that I've been involved in and engaged with, with policymakers in the UK, is that how do we get the next Google in the UK? Which is high in the sky in my mind, but you know, this is Google DeepMind, that DeepMind started here and then was brought up by Google. It's still presented as a UK company in policy discussions, but it's really not. Uh, it's got a London office, but it's really not. Uh, a UK company in the same way, and Google has so much influence over what they do and what they're going to do. So the the policymakers I've engaged with in the UK government have not taken that cautious approach. They are much more along the line of there is a pillar where we, we've got a direction we're going in. We want the next Google. We want an ARPA. Dominic Cummings is very famous for saying that he wants to run the next ARPA in the UK. So you have DARPA in America. We want ARPA without the D. Um, so. <laughs> It's this line of thinking, and it's, it's there in the thinking behind the A-level algorithm and using this technology specifically for predicting people's lives, and it's very hard to push back against that. So there's been a few interfaces I've had, but uh, not not as many as I'd like. Probably. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I guess I, I just have... Um... One, uh, one, one idea, or, or it's more like of a comment rather than a question as I was uh, listening to you um, speaking and answering the, the questions before. Um, so I was thinking, well, if, if AI becomes, as it's already sort of becoming a sort of new religion, right? Um, then how should the state treat this new religion? So I was thinking, so my background is in philosophy and, um, and I've been dealing with questions of how the state should deal with, with uh, religions, with religious citizens, and so on. Now, one of our core principles in Western democracy is obviously secularism, okay? So the idea that the state has to be independent from the influence of religions and vice versa, that religions have to be autonomous and citizens, religious citizens have to be autonomous and not uh, being interfered with by the state. Now, if we think that AI then is also potentially a religion, a religion, religious belief, then how should the state interact or deal with, 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 with this new tool? So arguably, AI is not just an ideology, but also a tool. So I think it's, in a way, the state has to serve itself of this tool, because we know of all the very beneficial implications of this new technology, but at the same time, it's also an ideology. So I can see here that normatively speaking, yes, AI, AI new religious movements can be seen as religious, but also in a way a little bit different from other sorts of religions in this normative, um, with this normative distinction. I'm not sure if I made myself clear enough. No, absolutely. No, I think it is a difficulty because uh, historically uh, governments have found it very difficult to interact or to engage with new religious movements unless they start falling into like the world religion paradigm of looking like a christian church basically of having a location having a doctrine having a book so they find it very difficult to deal with more abstract ideological groups perhaps those uh, like i look at that 
have a strong social media existence, that they don't have a strong geographical existence. It's very hard to bound that space. And my work previously on the UK censuses was about partly this idea that numbers matter as well, that the Jediism in that instance, the focus on the narrative around if we get enough numbers, the government has to deal with us, has to give us things. It was there in lots of different religions at the same time, but Jediism, the virality of the email conversation, really pushed that idea. And on the whole, our government here in the UK doesn't deal with groups that don't fall into those neat boxes. While at the same time, as I say, AI as a as a particular instance of techno determinism is very popular in the UK government to then kind of push the idea that it is an ideology as well as a tool and therefore should be treated more cautiously in these in these directions. I don't I don't see that as part really of their conversation. They find it very interesting when someone like me comes along and says, well, here are some people using religious metaphors and language. And there's some for some people, it's an ontological reality for others, it's parody and there's a slippage there. But some will find that interesting. But then to actually think about policy in relation to new ideas like that, they're very slow at dealing with new formations of ideological community. Uh, they have had instruments for uh, observing them that have slipped by and by. So in the UK, uh, Inform was very influential, started by Eileen Barker, obviously in the 1980s, was very influential in helping to categorize groups, find their links um, in, a, in, in an academic neutral way, but to actually say, this, these are the elements you should be paying attention to. And then the government defunded them a, a little while back. So that relationship, that intermediary of an academic institute, they're still around in various forms, but they haven't got Quite the same engagement and I think the same thing applies to, to discussions of groups around AI and AI itself as a religious concern there's no sort of there's no literacy in our government here to actually understand what's happening and I think that is broadly speaking there's a lot of difficulty around literacy of what AI is and can be everywhere but I think when it comes to the government as well specifically in the social aspects of AI they're, they're lacking so I don't I don't have Again, we don't have solutions for, for problems like this, but I think it's interesting the influences that we can measure and draw attention to, and that perhaps aids transparency as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Mm. Thank, you, thank you, Beth, for your for your very rich and interesting answer. Um, I'm I'm just reading in the in the chat box a question by Professor Ventura. Um, so, Professor, would, would you like to uh, to intervene, or shall I read your your question? I, I, can, I can read it. Oh, did, did people not see it? Or, like, well, I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be happy to yeah, convey that in person. Hello, Beth. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for 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 being with us, and um, so 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 interesting and challenging. So. I was I was struck by your reference to Harari, especially as in your summary you were you really referring to this opposition between religion and spirituality, which of course speaks a lot to um, scholars in religious studies. But then you know you see that the uh, opposition in the context of your analysis and all uh, the new aspects the, uh, of that of that debate and I, I had a sort of feeling like oh but this is old <laughs> you know this is this is somehow old fashioned in in such a new discussion so this was really from just you know uh, is is it true can, can that be useful or uh, what do you feel about the the, the meaning and and, and and relevance of the of the distinction yeah well absolutely the this kind of religion spirituality dichotomy discourse is very old. I mean, you could probably start seeing its roots back to the Enlightenment. Likewise, I think some of the presumptions about rationality at play in the discussion about AI have similar sorts of roots, so they're probably very entangled over, over the centuries. This idea that religion is a thing of dogma, hierarchies, and therefore subsumable by something that comes along later, but it relies on old-fashioned religion, this is what I'm saying, relies on old-fashioned irrationalities whereas spirituality for some people in this conversation they're saying it can be born from new rationalities from the, it's, it's sort of the 18th 19th century presumptions about how scientific progress works as well and their entanglements in that era 
with what we would now call spirituality and some of the elements of the ideas about particularly in spiritualism rather than spirituality but in spiritualism the ideas of being uh, an experimenter with spirituality and finding access to new information that has that kind of scientific approach and i think there's definitely a thread of that coming through in the discussion of ai and I, i've written in other places about those sorts of parallels between uh, the, the the metaphysical assumptions of ai and the scientific metaphysical assumptions of things like spiritualism and i think this dichotomy that harari is drawing on has these long roots and comes out again and again in the more atheistic interpretations of ai as something that will come along and save us from our irrationalities including religion i have a book chapter unfortunately i don't know when it's going to be published because things don't always work out timing wise but a book chapter on dan brown's book origin if you've come across it and that's very much i mean i don't necessarily recommend reading dan brown i've now read it far too many times but dan brown's book origin is all about an ai and the end of religion but not in his mind and how it comes through the story not the end of spirituality there's a very practical aspect again of seeing the ai in that story using religion for particular nefarious ends i don't want to give spoilers too much but but spirituality is still there at the end of the book in this presumption that spirituality is something different to religion. And I think this is a narrative that you see more in the, the AI rationalist community, even those, as I say, who are quite strongly atheistic, they see religion as this thing of the past and spirituality perhaps through technology is still possible. So another quick example, uh, when it comes to Sophia, she and her creators have used her in meditational practices in order they believe through robotic medita meditation led by this robotic entity to lead human subjects to transcendence. So they still have this idea of spirituality, but they're using it through technology, or they're employing and enabling spirituality through technology in their minds. There's a couple of papers on Sophia leading these meditational practices and how the people involved see this as the next step for human spirituality. So yeah, I think it's absolutely that's that's an important dichotomy in the conversation that I'm looking at and how it's expressed wider in the AI community as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beth, Beth I was also wondering, um, and I think in a way, uh, what I'm going to say now sort of goes back to what we just discussed before, right? So, um, what religious beliefs are ideologies really are because some of them obviously can't really be put into clear-cut boxes yeah so i was wondering whether you know Sorry, could be drawing, um in new religious movement can you hear me now can you hear me now yeah um i was wondering whether uh, a parallel may, may be drawn between um new religious movements centered around ai and say environmentalism okay so um as i was listening to your presentation um i was also thinking of evocative language vocabulary um that can be used which 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 taps which taps into spiritual uh, vocabulary and um, terms that come from spirituality also to refer to nature so for instance instead of having a tweet um you know that says blessed by the algorithm i can think of a tweet or an expression that says you know blessed by the sun yeah and then so we have this evocative language uh, metaphors and then we also have uh, a, a culture and and also a uh, like strong belief systems which are centered around the idea that nature is a sort of god obviously and you know also the, the value of the environment like the principle that also politics itself has to has to protect and uh, one of the core principles on which policy um, policies should be structured around. So would you say that the same implications that you draw in your paper regarding the, the tweets, you know, blessed by the algorithms could be drawn with regard to tweets, which, you know, for instance said, blessed by the sun, or is there a difference? If there's a difference, how do we distinguish the two? Yeah, and I suppose an immediate difference would be uh, the history we have of uh, deification of natural elements versus a history of deification of AI. Perhaps we're seeing more super agential AI narratives, whereas 
historically the mythological narratives that could be called AI, like the Golem or the Handmaids of Hephaestus, they weren't deities. They were still tools and servants, but you know, personified in various ways. So that's, I suppose, one difference. I think one similarity is um, talking about the talking about environmentalism as an ideology that there have been cases legal cases where people have tried to pursue the argument that things like veganism or environmentalism should be as protected as religious belief and I don't know of all the outcomes of those cases but that again speaks to what I was saying earlier about the difficulty of regulators legislators and policymakers is dealing with ideological groups that don't fit into neat boxes and those boxes obviously come from a western judeo-christian conceptualization of what religion is so if you don't have xyz attributes you're not a religion because you don't have a church building or whatever so there's similarities there definitely i think also what's slightly different between well a fine line maybe the difference between being blessed by the sun versus being blessed by AI is that, is that AI does do things. I don't argue necessarily it does everything that these blessed by the algorithm tweets are saying, but it's certainly, as, as the, the earlier question, we have examples where machine learning systems are making decisions on our behalf. So there is an algorithm doing things on YouTube to decide whether your content is promoted or not. It's not doing things exactly in the same way that the blessed by the algorithm tweets say, because that, that's a level of agency that's not there. The, the priorities going on with the algorithm are all about clicks, uh, clickbait, user engagement, things, values that are set by YouTube as a corporation. The assumption that's coming in in the blessed by the algorithm tweets is that it's a decision independently being made by an algorithmic system that's mystified in some way, it has a mystifiable element to it. Whereas I, the sun in blessed by the sun tweet with it, it's doing the things it always does but it's not changing the, the anthropomorphism and the deification of the sun would see that it's changing do you see the distinction i mean it, it's a very fine distinction because it's about perception because the perception that the a, that the sun is doing something is similar to the perception that ai is doing something but ai is also doing something different on different days the sun being more continuous the agency is different in a way like yeah, yeah. Similar, i think that's definitely a valuable uh parallel to be drawn out both in the similarities and the difference environmentalism becomes an ideology that's difficult to define has religious characteristics and it could be implicitly religious ai has the same sort of things but the, the, the focus is slightly different between the sun and the ai if you see what i mean thank you beth um we now have two more questions Okay. Uh, so one is uh, by Peggy Reader. Peggy Reader, um, please, the floor is yours. I don't know if uh, she or he can hear us. If not, maybe we can... Oh, okay. It doesn't let me turn on my microphone. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Please type your question, and I will I will read it out. Uh, maybe we can we can skip to Dominic uh, Dominic's question first, and then I will read Peggy Peggy's question. Dominic, please. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. And I actually have a very brief comment and one question. So I kind of light in my comment. <laughs> um, I noticed the, the, the graph that you actually showed with the increase of uh, the tweets about the algorithms. And um, I wondered, uh, it, it kind of reflect uh, the, incre the general increase in Twitter usage in those years. I mean, starting from 2012, there was a massive increase in the usage. So there is definitely a correlation between the rise of, of those tweets and the rise of Twitter in general and of its like usage. So it's, it's kind of difficult to know whether we are just assisting about uh, to, to, to a real increase of this kind of position or to a very simple correlation with, the, the, let's say, the popul pop with the growing popularity of the platform. And that was uh, actually the command. And the question is, 
I was wondering uh, when you were talking about the various, um, let's say, uh, religious conceptions of the AI, and I was thinking about the, the Church of Google and other similar, uh, let's say, parodies of religious yeah. movements. And clearly, some of the tweets are uh, missing contextual information about whether people are serious or not about what they are saying. So. Uh, I'm wondering how, how you actually uh, define the line, the distinction line between people who are really trying to uh, say something that's uh, related to a religious discourse and between people who are just you know trying to make fun of something because they don't believe what they are actually saying. Yeah, um, okay, so just on your comment, absolutely could represent uh, an increase in Twitter usage that I cannot kind of uh, defer from the results. Uh, but also, I mean, we're also at the same time as seeing an increase of Twitter usage, we're also seeing an increase in usage of platforms with algorithm systems, algorithm, algorithmic systems. So, you know, your Ubers, your Lyft, your YouTube content maximizers, all these things come in at the same sort of time. So, I mean, I'm not, I, the, it's not really a quantitative study in that sense. I don't actually want to try and prove any kind of causation. What I'm, I'm noting is that there, there is this conversation that's being had online. And, and to, to go on to your second point, which I think is, is valuable, that I'm, I'm not trying to define the line. Actually, I'm interested in both. So the parodies and the, the more ontological assertions. And my argument as, a, as an anthropologist has always been we cannot really ever define that line. Having looked at groups like uh, Scientology and Jediism and the, the shift and the, the blurring of that line between the, the, the humor and the seriousness with any encounter with a religious group or a religious idea or a religious person, we can't, as the observer, make that decision for them. And it might seem more obvious in some examples uh, that it's parody, and it might seem more uh, obvious in other examples that it's something that, that people are actually seeing as having a direct impact on their belief system and how they operate in the world. But I don't know that it's up to us to kind of come and decide where that line sits. What, what's more interesting for me is actually that the conversation is being had with those framings that religion, for all the narratives in specifically the AI community about the end of religion, the religious language continues and the drawing on the cultural context for these people relies on elements like prayer, conception of a God entity and so forth. So yeah, so uh, that, that's always been my sort of baseline take. And for some people, when you talk about taking parody seriously as an example of discourse, they, they can be a little dismissive about that approach. But I think it's valuable to know where the jokes multiply, feed into each other, the impact of the mesic culture and in some instances of new religious movements like Jediism, it does lend greater legitimacy that does lead to people doing more of the authentic normative religious stuff like having ceremonies, in-person things, wearing clothes, having locations, all the things as I say we have been, we have been inclined to think of as proper religion because it fits into more of that western Christian idea of what a church and a culture and a community is when it comes to religion. So I hope that kind of tackles both your comment and your question. Thank you, Beth and uh, Dominic, for your question. Um, now we have two more written on the chat box, and I will maybe try to um, read them out or summarize them briefly, and then you can maybe answer them together or as you prefer. So. Um, Peggy asked to what extent the, the algorithm is influencing your fieldwork online and uh, how you first came across these tweets. Um, and also if similarities can, can be seen in other languages. And then we have another um, question by, by Simone uh, who asks, um, why would ever believe in, in a man-made um, technology God? So, um, if, if the concept of God usually revolves around an almighty figure, why would we ever look for, for a God in something that we can predict and trust um, perfectly, let's say? Okay, let's see how quickly I can do these two questions, because I think we finished it. Well, it's four o'clock for me, it's five, five o'clock for you, so I've got four minutes. Okay, so 
Yes, the algorithm. Was I blessed by the algorithm in finding the blessed by the algorithm tweet? Well, no, because primarily uh, in using um, a UI that takes away Twitter's preference system, I actually kind of go past Twitter's algorithm. So using a more historical approach to tweets when I was doing my corpus scraping from Twitter, how did I first come across them? I actually don't remember. I must have, because I'm always online. I'm a bit of a, a Twitterholic. So I must have seen one at some point and it got into my subconscious and then I went looking for the rest. Uh, is there anything similar visible in other languages? Unfortunately, I'm very uh, monolinguistic. So I don't, I don't have any language skills in any other language. I tried Japanese once or twice. Uh, so I don't know, but that would be an interesting area for further research. If I could team up with people who spoke other languages, that would help. I suppose, I, I mean, I could do a search based on a very simple Google translate of the expression and have a look. Uh, so it's a very narrow English focus, I suppose. Uh, okay, so the other question was, why would man believe in it? Okay, um, so I don't approach this topic theologically. But that is a is a fair theological question that I've seen amongst Christian theologians in particular, seeing this as perhaps a form of idolatry. Man creates AI, man worships AI, that's idol making. Um, yeah, okay. Thanks, Erica, that's a good point. <laughs> But we'll team up and you can help me with the Japanese at some point. Um, yes, so that's, that's a fair theological question. For some of these groups, the theological question is answered by, oh, it's quite complicated, but this idea of um, AI as God as being somehow involved in simulation theory and actually ahistorically having created the universe. Hi, Robert. Um, so it, 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 I, I go into it a little bit more in my paper uh, if you want to have a look at that. But this is, some of this is more theistic interpretations. The theism from deism is the idea there are no gods now, but there will be, and that will kind of ahistorically have created them in the past. So uh, sorry if I don't explain that very well, but as I say, I've, I've gone into it a little bit more depth in my paper and I'm trying to keep the time here. Thank you very much, Beth, for for finishing just right right on time and uh, for your very interesting presentation again and uh, and your rich answers to the questions um, thank you everyone for for attending the seminar now back to back to Boris so uh, yeah Beth thank you very much also from my side um, that was great that was a great discussion thank you also to everyone who contributed, listened, and uh, joined us here? That that was that was absolutely beautiful. Um, let me just remind you to finish this um, uh, episode of our next um, next meeting online, which will be on October the fourteenth. We will have the uh, cultural sociologist uh, Steph Orpers from the uh, KU Leuven, um, Catholic University of Leuven. Uh, he will be talking about, uh, his, his title will be Things Greater Than Thou, AI and a te Technical Reenchantment of the World. So um, thank you very much again, everyone, and I hope to see you again here online. And great. Thank you. Hey, thanks, everyone. Thank you for coming to listen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.